Colossians chapter 1, we're going to begin today at verse number 20, and we will read through verse 29. Colossians 1, yes, verses 20 through verse 29. Put it on the screen for the benefit of those of us here in the sanctuary. Colossians 1, verses 20 through verse 29. And the King James text today reads, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable. Listen to the next phrase in his sight. If ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister, according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Listen. The hope of glory. Whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect, meaning complete or mature, in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. I want to talk to us today on the topic, I sure hope so. Hallelujah. I sure hope so. If you bow your heads with me one more moment today. Father, once again, God, we are grateful for the word of the Lord. We are grateful for the presence of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I thank you for this nearly 20 years that I have devoted to the city of Dallas, that I have devoted to with all my energy and all that, that I had in an effort to bring the reconciling full gospel truth to all people in this city, whether they be straight, gay, whether they be black or white, whether they be rich or poor, whether they be fat or skinny, ugly or pretty, Master, I thank you for this time, for I know God. The Word of God promises all things. Mm. 
Gida ba bonto, mama ra tika ra bonto shabama. Oh, hallelujah. All things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Lord, if nothing else, this has been a time of the iron sharpening iron. If nothing else, Lord, this has been the time of Moses serving in his father-in-law's house, working in the fields, tending the flocks that belonged to his father-in-law so that he might prepare. Oh, hallelujah. So that he might prepare for the time, the hour when God would speak to him from a burning, fiery bush and call him to become the shepherd of God's sheep. Master, if this has been a time of preparation, then I receive it gladly. For Lord, I would not go into any field of labor unprepared. I thank you, God, for your training. I thank you for teaching. I thank you for hewning me, shaping me, helping me. Oh God, I've got so much further to go. I've got so much more to learn. Oh Master, today I must do my job. I must do what you've called me to do. I'm grateful you've not called me to be perfect or to walk on water or to part any seas or rivers because the ability for that is not in me but I am able by the Holy Ghost at least to preach the Word of God and to preach it in a way Lord that might bring honor and glory to your name in a way that might inspire faith in the heart and in the hearing of the hearer Master, I believe you want to perform a work in people's lives. You want them to understand sound doctrine and sound truth. We live in a time of confusion. We live in a time today, God, when there are voices being heard at every turn, pulling and tugging us in every possible direction, doctrinally. We ask God today that you would settle the matter in our hearts. Help us to lead this service with a clear understanding of your word. I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Without the anointing, this cannot be achieved. I need you, Lord, today to touch the ear of every hearer. For without the preparation of the Holy Ghost, of the heart of the hearer, my words might fall upon rocky or stony ground. And Lord, the Word of God may not find good earth and good ground from which to take seed and take hold and grow and prosper and bring forth fruit. Touch the ear of every hearer. Touch my feeble lips of clay. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' precious sacred name. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Talking to us today on the topic, I sure hope so. Twice in our primary text, Colossians 1, 20 through verse 29, twice the Apostle Paul uses the word hope. In the second instance, he refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, which is Christ in you? Verse 27. He said, which is Christ in you? And then he refers to the Lord as, listen, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. The Word of God declares, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ has become for the believer the hope of glory. Well, wait a minute. 
shouldn't he simply have become the realization of that glory? Shouldn't we now be able to say that as children of God, we absolutely, unequivocally, without a doubt, without a question, we glorify God that we no longer like the unbeliever, like the sinner, we no longer in a position where uh, we fall short of the glory of God. Oh, no, 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 oh, no, no, no. No, honey, the writer of that passage was speaking as much of you and I as he was the unbeliever outside of the church. He was speaking as much of you and I as he was the drunkard in the bar room or the prostitute in the red light district of your city. The truth is that in this flesh, it is impossible for a human being to fully and completely glorify God as God would desire to be glorified. No, we've got too many things working against us. We've got too many struggles going on. We've got too many faults and failings. There are things which the flesh, listen to me now, simply will not permit us to do. This is why the Word of God says concerning the law that the law, listen to me now, being weak through the flesh. You see, the law couldn't work. It could not bring righteousness and holiness to the people of God, Israel. Couldn't do it, couldn't do it, couldn't do it, Paul said. Why? Because it was weak through the flesh. You see, the flesh just won't allow it. <laughs> the fact that you and I today are wearing flesh and blood bodies just won't allow us to fully glorify God in our body, to fully glorify God in our lives as we ought. But Jesus Christ has become for the church today the hope of glory. Hallelujah. Oh, there is a hope because of Christ that we one day will be the glory of God. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Oh, my goodness. The Word of God said the day will come when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, thus glorifying God the Father. How do we glorify God the Father? It's going to be that day when all of humanity, when every human voice will speak in unison and declare, Jesus Christ is God, hallelujah, and all of a sudden God receives the glory because how many people today refuse to acknowledge that? How many people today do not want to confess and acknowledge that God himself placed himself in the very creation that he created so that he could suffer and he could die and he could rise again on behalf of his own creation. How many people today, both religious and non-religious, refuse to acknowledge? No, it wasn't God that did. God sent somebody else to do it. No, the Father. Oh, no. The JW tells us the Father took Michael the Archangel and transformed him into this man, Jesus. The Mormon tells us that the Father had sons, not just one. He had sons, one of which was Jesus, one of which was Lucifer. Yes, according to Mormon teaching, Lucifer and Jesus are brothers, folks. Jesus presented the better plan 
of the two. And that's what made the devil so mad. Bless God, made him so mad. Satan got so angry because God the Father accepted his brother's plan instead of his. Then we've got Trinitarian folks that want to make Jesus number two out of three. They're willing to acknowledge that the Word of God clearly assigns to Him divinity. But the only way they can feel comfortable wrapping their mind around the divinity of Christ is by making Him the second person of some triune Godhead. But the day is going to come when God's going to set everything clear and there will no longer be any misunderstanding. There will no longer be any uh, miscommunication. Uh, uh, there will no longer be anyone who does not know for a fact that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the more the man born to the Virgin Mary in a manger in Bethlehem was not Jehovah God Almighty, hallelujah, manifest in human form so that he could do what no man could do because the flesh simply would not permit it. And the only way it could get done is if God assumed a human form. The only way possible was for God to do the job Himself. That's why the Word of God tells us, the Apostle Paul declared, For without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness, meaning the mystery of God's nature. He said, God, not the Son of God, God was manifest in the flesh. But see then, first he's talking about the flesh. Now didn't I just say that's where the problem lies is in the flesh? But then listen to this. But then Paul said, justified in the Spirit. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. So his flesh was that of fallen man. But the spirit within was perfect. The spirit within was without sin. The spirit of within was divine. Hallelujah. The spirit within was God. Hallelujah. This is why in our primary text today, the Apostle Paul said, and having made peace through the blood of his cross by him, speaking of the man Jesus, listen, to reconcile all things unto himself. So, oh, hallelujah. Mm. Oh my God, I, I get so excited sometimes. I wish to God I had a big old Pentecostal church with some Holy Ghost filled folk so we could all start to shouting and dancing in the aisles and getting a little happy about now. He said, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. He didn't say, by him to reconcile all things unto God. That's not what he said. He said, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say. Oh my goodness. Then go to verse 22. In the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable, and unreprovable, but this next three words changes everything. In his sight. If ye continue in the faith, 
grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. See, the biggest problem we have, especially in Pentecostal circles, because Pentecostalism is basically based on Wesleyanism, okay? It is uh, a branch of the Wesleyan movement. It was the Wesleyan movement that brought us the Holiness Movement. It is the Holiness Movement that then preceded the Pentecostal Movement. The Holiness Movement, as it were, gave birth to the Pentecostal Movement. But it all traces back to Wesley. And Wesley, bless his heart, had very much lost sight of God's grace and had begun to focus more on man's ability to quote-unquote live holy and live godly and do right and how that this was required, how that God required this of those who would desire to be saved. And the Pentecostal movement especially. There are others as well, many of the fundamentalist and evangelical camps have gone off the rails because they don't understand this important premise of our faith. And that premise is this. The writers in the epistles speak of the church, often speak of the church in certain terms, and they say certain things about the church and about God's people because they're speaking and they're writing from a spiritual perspective, not from a literal perspective. What I mean by that is when the Apostle John says, for instance, that a child of God can no longer sin, Well, he says in one place in the same chapter, he said that how can we walk in sin if we've settled sin? And sin has been a settled matter for us. But then he goes on to later say, if we have, if we say that we have no sin, then we make God a liar and the truth is not in us. In the same chapter, the, the Apostle John says these things. And yet we got foolish people in the church who can't put two and two together and they can't allow the Holy Ghost to quicken their minds so they understand this important truth. Much of what is written of the church, much as what is written of God's people in the Word of God is written as a in, in a spiritual sense, meaning it is written by faith, as it were. In other words, a child of God by faith can no longer sin. It is impossible for a child of God by faith to sin. Why? Because we're not a capable of sin, because we have no sin in us? No, because John tells us in the same chapter that that is not the case, that we do have sin, and we are sinners. Do you follow what I'm saying? So what, where, how do we settle this conflict? It's very easy. It's very easy. Look again at what Paul said in Colossians chapter 1. And verse 22, he said, In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable, listen, in his sight. See, it's all about not the reality down here but God's perception up there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. If we're walking by faith in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, if we're holding on, like I said last Sunday, if we're holding on to Him as our covering, if we're allowing Him to be our covering, then guess what? Then a child of God cannot sin in the sight of God. God don't see sin in His sight. He doesn't perceive sin in His people. Haven't you ever seen a mother or a father love their kids so much and that 
kit was a holy hellion as far as you and I could tell. We watched that kit do things and watch them behave and watch them act like little demons and yet mom and dad sat there with this big stupid look on their face so proud of that baby. They just thought he was the catch me out. They just thought he or she was an angel sent from heaven. From our perspective they were a demon sent from hell. But from mom or dad's perspective they were an angel sent from heaven. They could do no wrong. Haven't you ever heard this say? So he can do no wrong. Does that mean that person literally can do no wrong? No, it's not what it means. It means from the perspective of a certain person, whether it be a mother or a father or a grandma or a grandpa or an aunt or an uncle, what have you, from their perspective, that child can do no wrong. Right. Do you follow what I'm telling you? I got news for you today, saints. From God's perspective, you can do no wrong. The only way you can do wrong from God's perspective is if you abandon your faith and then if you purposely choose to do those things without any acknowledgement of God or any fear of God in your heart. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Now you've rejoined the ranks of the unbeliever. Now you're living once again as an unbeliever. So now God sees you as doing wrong. Do you follow what I'm telling you? But as long as Paul said, listen, he said, how do we walk in the sight of God, unblameable, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable? He said, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled... And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Mm. Oh, I sure hope so. Lord, am I ever going to be what you want me to be? Am I ever able? Am I ever able? Hey, let me, I'm going to get this out if it kills me. Am I ever going to be able? To be what you would fully wish for me to be. I sure hope so. And the Lord says, absolutely. And you've got hope. You've got hope that this is going to be accomplished. Well, how do I have hope? Because let me tell you a little secret. Hope comes when we see something that just shines even the smallest speck of light on the horizon. Hope is not something that is groundless. Hope is not something that, you know, a lot of times uh, people use the word hope and faith interchangeably and they make a mistake in doing so. Faith is not hope and hope is not faith. Now you have faith when you see nothing. But you possess something from God, a promise, you have His promise, you have His Word, and you stand on that promise or you stand on that Word, that is faith. You don't see anything that says that what you're standing on is going to happen. People look at you like you're nuts because as far as they're concerned, you're, you're standing on nothing. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But that is not hope. Hope is different than faith. Hope is shed abroad in our hearts as human beings when even the slightest light shines off in the distance. Let me use, for instance, 1912, the sinking of the Titanic. The Titanic is sinking. There are no ships coming to rescue it. None that anyone is aware of anyway. The lifeboats are filling up with people. They're being lowered into the darkness of the deep. And they're being paddled away from the sinking ship. Many people at that moment in time may have been thinking to themselves, my God, we're going to die out here. Nobody even knows we're here. Nobody. It's dark. It's uh, uh, Nobody will even be able to see us. They're, you know, uh, Lord, all hope is gone. There, there's nothing. 
There's no hope. Now, there may have been somebody in one of them lifeboats who says, no, I have God in my life and God has promised me that He would deliver me in the hour that I call upon Him. He promised He'd hear me. So I have faith that God will see me through. Others have no faith. And because they have no faith, they also find themselves feeling hopeless. But listen, hours later, the Carpathian off on the far horizon. If you've ever ridden in a cruise ship or on a ship and you've been out at sea, then you know that the world looks like it ends at the horizon where the sky meets the water. And all of a sudden where the sky meets the water, perhaps they begin to see light. They begin to see the lights of the ship shining. And as they begin to see those, now that ship is miles away. But as that ship begins to appear on the off far horizon, they don't know if that ship knows their ship has sunk. They don't know if that ship is looking for them. They don't know whether or not that ship will be able to see them and their tiny lifeboats because from that ship's perspective, they're on the horizon. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? They don't know, but they begin to experience hope. Why? Because there's a monochrome of possibility. There is a monochrome of chance that they might be rescued. Do you follow what I'm telling you? All you need sometimes to have hope is the slightest, tiniest evidence that your circumstance can change. All of a sudden, you feel hope stirring up in you. See, a lot of times people will say to one another, you know, they'll have a loved one in the hospital dying and, and the doctors say all is lost and, and what have you and the, there's no hope in the world and blah, blah. And others will say to them, well, you know, have hope. Just have hope. You don't just have hope out of the clear blue sky. You don't just have hope to have hope. No, hope has to see some evidence somewhere that there is some remote possibility of help on the horizon. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Well, I've got news for you today. The fact that Jesus Christ lived died on the cross of Calvary and rose from the dead gives us hope that we too can follow in his footsteps. Gives us hope that we too then can be made partakers of his righteousness. Gives us hope that we too might one day become what he in the flesh became. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Which is king of kings and lord of lords. It gives us that hope. We see this little tiny sliver. And because we believe the report of the apostles. That this literally happened. That this really happened. Because we believe that by faith. We have hope. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? <clears throat> but in everything we possess as a child of God, we do not possess necessarily in substance or in reality, but we possess it by faith and we possess it through hope. In Romans 5, Chapter, uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. You see, Paul never says we're a finished product. Paul never says that because we believe the gospel and we're a child of God that we're all of a sudden we're finished. We become holy. We become perfect. We become everything we're supposed to. Do you follow what I'm telling you? That's what preachers will tell you. That's what Christians will tell you. That's what churches will tell you. That's what denominations will tell you. But that is not what the Word of God says. 
the Word of God says that our faith then gives us hope. Hallelujah. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Sometimes we have hope because, not because we see the light of the Carpathian in the distance, but because we've been here before. And the last time I was here, another ship showed up. Do you follow what I'm telling you? And because I've been here before, my experience gives me hope. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, sometimes you get sick and you get to the point where you feel like uh, all is lost and the doctors have said they've done all they can do. And glory to God, this old fat preacher is able to say, I have hope. Hallelujah. Why do I have hope? Because I've been here before. <laughs> Woo, glory. I've been at that place where the doctors gave up. I've been at that place where they said I would die. I've been at that place where they held out no hope. Honey, I've been there and God showed up. And because I've been there, my experience, hallelujah, has given birth to hope. This is why God told the children of Israel to repeat in the hearing of the Jewish children. The stories of the exodus from Egypt. He said, tell your children these stories. Tell them over and over again about how I parted the Red Sea. Tell them over and over again about how I led you through the wilderness in the form of a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Tell them how I fed you with manna from heaven. Tell them how I provided water for you from the rock with Moses merely having to speak to the rock. Tell them these stories. Why? Because then they can share that experience with you. And in sharing your experience in their difficult time, in their time of trouble, in their time of distress, in their time of tribulation, they're going to be able to find what? Hope. Not faith. Listen, when God's people get up in the church and share testimonies of how God has done such wonderful, marvelous things for them, honey, that is not to inspire faith. The Word of God said, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You shouldn't believe God for a miracle because somebody said they've experienced a miracle. No, 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 no. You believe God for a miracle because God has spoken in His Word and said He will do it. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? But we inspire one another to hope for that miracle. To hope for those things that we need by hearing the testimony of others. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? In the distance... Excuse me, I'm sorry, I didn't finish Romans 5, 1 through 5. He said, And patience, experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. You know what, honey? When you have hope, you're never going to be sorry you had hope. Hallelujah. You will never be sorry that you held on to hope. In the distance, as it were, as children of God, we can see the realization of the full promises of God. We see one day standing in His presence, transformed and perfected. In our mind's eye, we can see the gates of pearl. We can see the streets of gold. Hallelujah. We can see the crystal sea. We can see the tree of life. We can see the Lamb of God sitting upon His throne. Hallelujah. In our spirit, we can see the reality.
communion with family and friends who have gone on before us. We hope for that which we have seen, not with our natural eye, but with our hearts, our minds, and our spirit. Our faith is in the realization of these hopes. See, what helps us to secure that which we hope for is our faith. Are we believing God to keep His promises so that everything we hope for, which we've seen in our spirit, which we've seen in our mind, which we've seen in our imagination, can we believe God to keep His promises in His Word so that we will one day see what we have hoped for? Oh my goodness. Faith is the substance of things. What? hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. I haven't seen it with my naked eye, but I've seen it with my spiritual eye. I haven't seen it with my human eye, but I've seen it in my spirit. I haven't seen it with my fleshly eye, but I've seen it in my mind, in my imagination. And I therefore am believing God for that because I believe He honors His Word. Hallelujah. I am not going to stand here as an LGBT believer today and tell you that I am confident of heaven because so-and-so said so, or because this preacher had that experience, or that preacher had this experience. I am confident of heaven because I believe the Word of God. I believe that Jesus said that whosoever believeth on Him. I believe the message of Christ was not a moralistic message. I don't believe the message of Christ was a message that demanded perfection of people. I don't believe the message of Christ was you must somehow find a way to change or else... I believe the message of Christ is, He that believeth on me shall not be ashamed. Hallelujah. Amen. And hope maketh not ashamed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you today, my confidence is in the Word of God. <coughs> Our faith is in the realization of those hopes. The survivors from the Titanic may have felt scared and hopeless in the darkness of the night as their ship sank slowly beneath the waves. But when the lights of the Carpathia appeared on the horizon, their faith gave way to hope. Hallelujah. Those who were believing God all of a sudden you see a light. Now you don't really have to rely on your faith so much, do you? Because now you have what? Hope. Hallelujah. Oh my Lord, now that they could see potential help and rescue, their hope was renewed. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 6 through 8, Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the, in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. Listen, and for an helmet, what do you keep wrapped around your mind? What do you keep wrapped around your head to keep you thinking straight? The hope of salvation. See, we sing as children of God. We sing, saved, saved. My sins are all pardoned. My guilt is all gone. Saved, saved. I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. We put a D on the end of the word save. Meaning it is past tense. Meaning it's already happened. But have we yet been fully saved? No. Not until the rapture we hadn't been. But we possess it by faith. Therefore, as the word of God says concerning our God, he calls those things which be not 
as though they were. Do you hear what I'm telling you? He changed Abraham's name. Abraham meant the father of many nations. When he changed Abraham's name from Abram, Abraham was not the father of anybody. But Abraham still went around with somebody and said, What's your name? He said, Hi, I'm Abraham. Hello now. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I'm here to tell you as a child of God, we haven't yet experienced the fullness of the hope of our salvation. But by faith, we own it now. Amen. And as long as we keep the faith, we keep owning it. Oh, hallelujah. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? Galatians 5, 3 through 5, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the law, to a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Now listen to this next phrase. Verse 5, Galatians 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. So Paul didn't get up there like a moron, like most Pentecostal preachers today, like most fundamentals and evangelical preachers today. Paul didn't get up there and tell you that he already owns righteousness, that he's already in possession of righteousness. He says, no, no, I possess righteousness, but the only righteousness I possess, excuse me, uh, is a righteousness that I'm hoping for. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And because I'm hoping for it, the only way I own it now is by faith. See, the biggest problem we have with theology in the modern church is they try to ascribe to you and I in the here and now that which we cannot possibly possess because of the flesh. We will possess it one day if we can hold on to the hope and believe God believe his promises hallelujah oh this isn't hard to understand children faith believes when there is no help in sight hope is when you're able to see in the far distance the possibility or even the probability of rescue or help people often say have hope in reality they ought to be saying have faith Hope is only available when there is some slight chance for assistance or rescue. Faith is needed when no help is visible. And all we can do is trust God to make something out of nothing. Christian living is the evidence of what we believe for. Why do we strive to live a godly life? Why do we strive to live a holy life? Why do we strive to look more like Jesus? Because we believe that is where we're headed. Hello now. Right now we possess holiness and righteousness by faith, but that doesn't mean that I cannot try to the best of my ability to live a holy and a godly life. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Because after all, if my aspiration is holiness, if my aspiration and it's righteousness. If my aspiration and my hope is that one day I'll be perfected, why in the world would I want to live completely and entirely contradictory to that now? Hello now. We live for God today because we sincerely believe that we shall live for Him in eternity. Here's an example of hope. I'm trying to hurry today. I think I'm winding up going over time. Acts 27, 18 through 20, an example of hope. Paul's in a ship. They've been tossed in the sea with a great storm for days and days. And they're trying everything they can to lighten the ship and survive this storm. But listen in verse 18. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. Meaning they threw stuff overboard to make the ship lighter so it wouldn't sink. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. So in order to try to keep the ship afloat, they literally threw things over they needed to navigate the ship. At this point, they're just trying to keep it afloat. 
And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, listen, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. Remember I told you hope relies upon some evidence somewhere that things are going to change. That they're, they're some little evidence. If they at least begun to see the stars. If they at least had begun to see a change in the circumstance. They've done everything they could do. But now they, the only thing that can happen if they're going to be saved is the situation has to change. Because they can't do any more than they've done. They've thrown over the cargo. They've thrown over the tackling. They, they've done everything they can. And look up, oh man, nothing's changed. There's not a star, and I can't see a star in the sky. I can't see nothing. Uh oh, all hope is gone. When the sun and the stars fail to become visible after three days, those in the ship with Paul, as well as the ship's crew, lost all hope. Why? Because they could not see any possibility of their situation being survivable. They had endured three days, but without a break in the weather in sight, it was not likely they would survive much longer. Colossians chapter 1, 21 and 20 through 23, he said, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, past tense, reconciled, in the body of his flesh, through death, to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If, if's the biggest word in the word of God, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled. You know why you wear a helmet of the hope of salvation? Because that helps you to stay grounded and settled. Hello now. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I told you before, Hebrews 11 and 1, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hope can also be the vision, or the visualization, as it were, of that for which we are believing God. We hope for that which we do not have, but we have, an, but we have a vision or we can visualize what we would like to see or what we would like to possess. And in that vision is our hope. Some hope for their marriages to be reconciled. Even though there is no evidence whatsoever that this will happen outside of a miracle. Some hope for the healing of their loved one. Although the doctors have said this is not at all possible. Faith is the substance of our hope. The action or the effort we put into our vision is substantive. Therefore, it is the effort and energy or the action that God then can use. It's the action, the effort that we put in to what we're believing God for that God then can use. Listen to me now. That becomes the substance. That becomes the clay in God's hands that God then can use to transform the situation and create the miracle you so desperately need. Faith is substantive. In other words, faith is not standing in a spot. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I, too many Christians think that's what faith amounts to. The Word of God said, no, faith without action is dead being alone. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. What is the substance of that which we hope for? It is the actions that we take. It is the effort that we put in. It is the energy that we expend related to that which we hope for. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? If you don't give God something to work with, 
He's not going to make something out of nothing. He said, no, no, you give me your faith. You give me your actions that demonstrate your faith. And then I'll take care of the rest. I'll turn what you're able to do into what you're not able to do. Oh, hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Faith is the substance of our hope. Therefore, it is the effort, the energy, the action that God then can use to transform the situation. Faith is substantive. Faith is not believing something will happen, but rather what we do because we believe something will happen. <laughs> oh my goodness. What we do because we believe something will happen. You know what? Sometimes that faith is manifested, listen to me now, in doing nothing. But by doing nothing, we're doing something. You remember when the ship was being tossed around in the storm and the disciples ran to Jesus at the back of the boat? He was what? Sleeping. He wasn't doing nothing. He was sleeping. And they said, Lord, don't you care that we perish? And he got up and he took care of the situation, but he turned around and rebuked them. Remember? Well, Lord, why in the world would you rebuke us? We did everything right. Why would you rebuke us? We did what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to come crying to you like a baby when we're afraid. We're supposed to, uh, we're supposed to come to you accusing you and not caring about us when things look troublesome and things look bad. No, that's not what y'all have done. If they'd all sat down on the boat and said, we're in God's hands, we have nothing to fear. Hallelujah. God has promised that he's going to take care of us. We got Jesus riding in this boat with us. He said, let's go to the other side. There ain't no way on earth we're not going to get to the other side. So let's just sit down, calm down, and relax a while. You know what would have happened? That storm would have stopped. Those winds would have ceased. Those waves would have ceased but that's not how they demonstrated their faith what did they demonstrate they demonstrated they had no faith do you follow what I'm telling you so sometimes the way we demonstrate our faith the way we act upon our faith is when we sit down and say okay God I trust you I believe it's in your hand I believe we're okay I'm not going to worry about it the Lord says, thank you very much. You just gave me something to work with. <laughs> Hallelujah. You just gave me the substance of your hope. And I can work with that. Oh my goodness, have mercy. Some folks believe their missing child will come home. So they keep their child's room intact and they preserve it for their child's return. Some go so far as to set the table with a place for their missing kid in anticipation of their imminent return. But faith Godward is not about acting on something we believe in absence of evidence that our desired end is even possible, but rather it is built upon the foundation of our relationship with God and our conviction and confidence in His promises. Lord, you're my daddy. You said, therefore, come boldly before the throne of grace. You didn't tell me that I needed to come cowering, walking into you with my head between my knees, you know, all is scared and afraid. No, a kid who knows their relationship with their father and knows they can trust their father to keep his word, what does that kid do? He comes running in the room and says, Daddy, Daddy, let's go to the zoo. You said we're going to the zoo today. Doesn't matter how tired that father is. It doesn't matter he wound up having to work overtime yesterday that he wasn't expecting to work overtime yesterday. He told his child they were going to the zoo on Saturday. So all of a sudden that kid comes tearing in there on Saturday morning and says, Come on, Daddy, let's go to the zoo. Let's go to the zoo. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Why does that kid do it? Because the child's confident in its relationship with the father and that child believes that its father is going to keep its word. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That's how we ought to approach our God today. So it's not just about doing things. 
that symbolically represent our anticipated end, but rather our doing things specifically related to the promises of God and our conviction in an, in an anticipated end that is based upon our faith in God. Lastly today, Romans 4, 16 through 21. I apologize for going so long today. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So shall thy seed be. And being not weak in flesh, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Hallelujah. As children of God today, folks, what Jesus Christ has given us is hope. He's given us hope for eternal life. He's given us hope for righteousness. He's given us hope that one day we will stand before God as we ought, as God would have designed us to stand before Him from the beginning had Adam not fallen. He's given us hope. And by faith we stand in that place even now. Just by faith in the gospel. God looks at us as though we're already there. You heard me just read to you with Abraham, the Word of God said that God calls those things which be not as though they were. He calls us His children. He calls us saved. He calls us sanctified. He calls us pure. He calls us holy. He calls us justified. But all of this is accomplished by faith because the realization of these things is yet hoped for. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Oh, hallelujah. We can see it on the horizon. We hope for it because we believe this gospel. And that gospel has shined a light of hope in our hearts. Hallelujah. Oh, am I going to make heaven? I sure hope so. Hallelujah. I sure hope so. But my hope is secured by my faith. Amen. In Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Would you stand with me this afternoon?